Welcome everybody. I'm Kurt Bernhardt. I'm the Director of Technology for OPSRC and this is one of our monthly tech talks. Um, today we've got Matt Mervis and Liz Rade with uh, Skills 21 going to talk to you about chat GPT and AI and how to use it in the classroom. I'll turn it over to Matt. Awesome. Thanks Kurt. Thanks Kashan. Nice to have you all here. Appreciate you making some time. Um, yeah, we're going to spend about 40, 45 minutes maybe talking through some slides, but it's a relatively small group. Please drop stuff into chat, or if you have a burning question like Liz, you can unmute yourself uh, and throw anything out there that might be uh, beneficial. Um, certainly let us know where you're coming from if that's something you're comfortable doing. And uh, we can circle back to this, but be curious if folks have been playing with chat GPT, if there's a one word reaction either when they first saw it or as they continue to play with it, uh, that'd be fun to circle back on. Great, so I'm Matt Mervis. I'm the director of the Skills 21 program at EdAdvance, and my colleague, Dr. Liz Rade is here with me. Um, EdAdvance is one of the six regional education service centers, nonprofit service centers, kind of like county offices of education um, in other parts of the country. And we're located in Litchfield, Connecticut, which is the Northwest corner of the state up in the hills where uh, we're happy to report it's snowing today. So I'm not, that wasn't sincere about the happy part. <laughs> All right, so it's really 30 plus on the agenda, but we'll talk just very, very briefly about Skills 21, sort of talk about the state of AI and generative AI specifically, which ChatGPT is in that bucket. Um, I'm gonna make an argument that like, this is actually this remarkable moment in time to do a little bit of rethinking around some of our instructional and assessment priorities. And then we're gonna unpack a project example um, to specifically look at how ChatGPT and AI tools can be used in the context of a student interest project. That's really our lens, um, but I think you can extrapolate that lens out to lots of different scenarios. But this thing is big. Um, there's all sorts of ways you can look at it from professional practice, you know, lesson planning, curricular resource, but also how kids respond to assignments. Our work and our DNA is around student interest projects, capstone projects. And so we're really going to look at it through the lens of a student project. Um, but again, I think some of the themes that we'll talk about will be transferable to all sorts of different settings. We'll talk a little bit briefly about some complementary AI tools. Jet GPT has all the all the heat and attention right now, but there are a number of really interesting tools in the landscape with more along the way and lots of time for questions and next steps. All right, so Skills 21 uh, at the Regional Service Center at Advance is a 20 year old program. Our kind of core DNA has been around project based learning. Uh, we've had support from the National Science Foundation over the last decade or so. And uh, we do a lot of work right now around personal student projects and platforms and challenges. Uh, the project, the picture there over the right is from a team challenge that we used to run pre-pandemic where students would do these really cool projects with a lot of voice and choice in them and then they exhibit in a rock arena here in, um, in Connecticut. Uh, the pandemic put a little bit of a kibosh on some of that programming, but we've really kept the DNA of project-based learning and authentic uh, project opportunities for students uh, significantly in play. All right, so let's jump in. We will come back to your questions in chat, by the way, as, or your observations in chat as we get towards the end. So AI is really kind of with us. It's with us everywhere. Um, it helps us get to work. It helps us route around traffic jams this morning in the snow. It helped me route around a couple car accidents that happened on my way to a school district to do some professional development. It certainly picks the next song that we often listen to in our Spotify playlist or the next movie we might watch on Netflix. And uh, to lesser or greater success, uh, it helps us interact with things like Google Home and Siri and Alexa. It's all AI in the background. And there's a million different examples of, of how that works. You know, interestingly, we've been at AI for some time. It sort of feels like it's just dawned on us um, with ChatGPT and all of its um, excitement and attraction. But uh, this is Frank Rosenblatt, 1956. He's working on a machine called the Perceptron. This is a five ton machine that took up an entire room. It's an IBM machine. And it was sort of the earliest version of AI. They used punch cards to feed a ton of data into it. And over time, it could learn on its own whether or not a card was marked on the left 
are marked on the right. Those are the earliest kind of vestiges of predictive AI. Um, and there's a great book I'd really recommend uh, that's just recently out called Genius Makers, The Mavericks Who Bought Us AI. Um, really, really good read and very interesting to sort of understand the history behind artificial intelligence. I mean, the reality, reality too, is that uh, even though there's a lot of excitement around AI, um, it's still hard. Uh, we've Predictive AI is what helps theoretically self-driving cars. And for all the expectation around that, we still can't quite do it. On a snowy day in New England, like it is today, um, you know, AI would not get us safely where we needed to go. So, um, you know, it's still very much a work in progress, even though we've been at it for some time. Now, generative AI is this kind of relatively new class of artificial intelligence and um, open AI, stability, GitHub are all good examples. These are cases where uh, the, the machine learning networks, neural networks are fed literally billions of lines of data. So in the case of open AI's chat GPT, the thing has ingested the entire corpus of the internet, as well as Google Scholar and a range of other um, text-based resources. Stability AI has a great tool called Stable Diffusion. It's been trained on 2.5 billion uh, images, and it's able to sort of take those images and then do things with them. GitHub is a tool uh, that software developers use. They have a really neat application called Copilot. Literally been trained, we use the word trained, on billions of lines of code. So what training really means, and this is a kind of a fun image to think about that, these are the, the neural networks slurping, this is a technical term, of course, slurping up all the data off of the internet and other resources. So training is when we're able to bring tons and tons of data into these machine learning networks and then they become self-learning. They're able to label and organize. And that's really why when you type something into ChatGPT, it's really just predicting based on all the text that it understands what a suitable response might be. You know, critics of it will call it a parlor trick. I think it's probably a little bit more than that. But it simply has ingested all this data, and then it's able to make predictions, whether you're asking it to generate a new image using stable diffusion, or asking it to write a lesson plan using chat GPT. Uh, here's Copilot. This is, a, I, I like um, GitHub's marketing of this. They call it your AI uh, pair programmer. And so the idea here really is that you can be a software developer and um, Copilot can help augment your capacity, help you predict the next line of code that you might need or fix a line of code. And that's a theme that I'd love to sort of bring through the conversation. How do we think about AI as something that will augment and enhance our work as teachers and students and learners and folks in cognitive um, industries? Uh, you know, there's certainly a conversation about replacement. We gotta think about what does it replace? What does it augment and what does it enhance? All right, so let's drill down on the on the on the the thing that's brought all the attention. So ChatGPT is a AI chatbot. It's based on a large language model, right? These kind of big data sets that's been trained on masses around uh, amounts of text. It's um, both a free research offering and now a paid service. There's a twenty dollar a month professional service. It has one hundred and seventy five billion parameters. So those are the kind of characteristics of the things that it learned. And it's not the only one. Um, in fact, in, in some ways, the T in GPT, which is generative pre-trained transformer, um, is really a technology that Google developed as part of their Lambda uh, large language model. So there's a few out there, and, and we're starting to see the results of that. Um, this is, it's just kind of fun to say, this is the largest consumer application in the history of technology. So this slide is actually a little dated. It talks about how quickly ChatGPT got to a million users, which was five days outpacing everything. But they're now at 100 million active, monthly active users, making it the largest consumer technology application ever. And what's fascinating is that there's still, you know, you'll bump into all sorts of folks who have not heard of it and come across it. So we're at some level, you know, kind of early days for um, mass adoption. So what makes ChatGPT different from kind of previous generative AI systems? Let's run through that a little bit. First, it's adaptive, right? So here I wrote it, asked it to write a lesson plan on fractions, and then I asked it to throw in a literature component. In seconds, it was able to do that without a hitch. Um, second, it's conversational. This is really to Liz's credit, not mine. Liz is a consummate fiber arts 
uh, maven. And so she threw a question at it about a knitting pattern or a plan with a scarf. It threw back an answer and it referenced line called K2 OG, K2 TOG. And even though Liz is a pro, she either faked that she didn't know what that was or literally didn't know what it was and explained, yes, that's knit two together. And then Liz went and had a conversation with it about something else that she was involved with, synchronized swimming specifically. I was there when she did it uh, relative to her daughter and came back to knit two together and carried on the conversation. So it keeps the state and it's able to have a sustained and really sustained conversation um, with the end user, which is novel and, and really makes it a little bit different. Um, it can combine wildly disparate ideas in real time. This was very popular, made the rounds on the Twitter verse, you know, write a biblical verse in the style of King James Bible explaining how to remove a peanut butter sandwich from a VCR. And again, here just moments later, um, it performs that. So there's really not many writing tasks that you can throw at the thing that it won't proficiently respond to. It will work with any language. In this case, we're showing it using some Python code. And it can fix and revise that language, which it can do with English and other foreign languages as well. So pretty powerful application, you know, and, and with a lot of capacity. And so it wasn't a big surprise. Uh, this thing was released on November 28th, I think it was, of 2022. By December 6th, um, the Atlantic Ma Magazine had declared that the college essay was dead. And then it only took three days later the, for them to come back and say that high school English was, in fact, in um, perilous shape. About a month later, a student from Princeton, 22 years old, launches GPT-0, which is a um, AI written content, which we call synthetic content detection tool. Um, actually, ChatGPT has released one as well, or OpenAI has, and it um, will catch quote unquote synthetic content about 25% of the time. So it's pretty tough to really um, identify synthetic content, at least where we are right now. So um, just a few days later, New York City and Seattle Public Schools banned uh, OpenAI's chat GPT. Other schools have well, although most, it's really been interesting, have decided to leave it open. Teachers have found a lot of utility with it. And I think there's a lot of thoughts about going back to that co-pilot idea. How do we you know, kind of use it to augment and enhance learning um, rather than ban it? Um, I'm happy to say that every teacher that I work with uh, gets a pretty clear snapshot when something's handed in using chat GPT. This is my son. He's 23 years old. He's a brand new English teacher. He's had a number of assignments come to him over the transom uh, with, uh, we'll call them inspired by chat GPT and has had no difficulty spotting them. Right now, the, the writing lacks some kind of tone and voice, although we'll see how long that really lasts um, for, but it's been kind of fun to chat with him about it. The reality is, is that these large language models or LLMs are viral. Um, some people say that OpenAI released ChatGPT like a virus onto the world. And that's probably not an unfair um, characterization, but we're here. Um, and the reality is that Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon have all had large language models waiting in the wings. They're now here. And it's really in a matter of moments, both disruptive and a challenge to schools and teachers and school leaders to think of it as a new literacy and to determine how to work with it. Um, the G you probably recognize, Google's got a large language model um, called Lambda that I mentioned. They're releasing a tool called BARD, um, which has had a mixed you know, early entry. And you may or may not recognize this little symbol on the bottom left. That is the Bing search engine. Um, maybe folks remember Bing. So Bing has launched something called Copilot, again, using some of that branding. And the Bing search engine um, will use ChatGPT style interfaces uh, in order to generate results. So when I say it's viral, it's disruptive, it's a new literacy, it literally is here. I mean, when you've got Google and Microsoft basically bringing it into their core products, um, it is ever present in this landscape and something we'll have to think about. I mean, I guess the good news is that we have a tiny little bit of time. I don't know if folks followed over the last five or six days um, when Microsoft rolled out the Bing Copilot. Um, 
the thing kind of went off the rails. It declared love for one of the New York Times columnists to talk about wanting to find the nuclear codes. I mean, it was it was not a really pleasant experience. And actually, funny enough, you know, Bard from Google had a rough launch, and now Microsoft's Bing has had a rough launch. And so that's good in a way, right? It lets us know that these companies need to put you know better guardrails on the large language models. And you know, I think schools will be careful and, and just kids and teachers will understand that these things have liabilities and limitations. But you know, it's it's a it's we've got a little time, but just a little, because they really are going to dominate the landscape um, in the way that Google quickly did in the search era. All right. So a few things to keep in mind, and then we'll kind of move into some of the pedagogy, just kind of moving from 20,000 feet down here. No pun intended with the co-pilots there. Um, so I think it is useful to think of it as a co-pilot. It is certainly not a Google killer at this moment. It does not replace Google. Um, and I'll explain why. And it and this is an important term. It does not replace what we call AGI, right? AGI is artificial general intelligence. So that would be when ChatGPT can not just remix something and respond in a creative way based on what it's trained. It's when it can actually solve new problems, write new things. You know, we're using this in, in health right now a little bit where the AI is helping to basically solve um, diseases and different types of cancer by looking at millions and millions and millions of scans. So when the artificial intelligence can kind of think on its own, that's where we're into this slightly sci-fi artificial general intelligence zone. It is not that. As nifty as it is, it is not that. All right, so what it is on the left, it's a free beta and a paid flat platform. Um, we were just talking with Kurt a little bit about student data privacy. We're located in Connecticut. Student data privacy is a big um, deal for us, as it is everywhere, but we've had a fairly aggressive law for about three years now. And student data privacy is not in the mix. Like folks have reached out to OpenAI and Microsoft about this, and the types of privacy protections that we at least need vendors to ascribe to are not there. Um, this is critical, and it's a fun term too. So JetGPT and the other AI tools um, often hallucinate, right? That's literally what the AI technicians or, or uh, engineers will call it, a hallucination where you ask it a question and it gives you an incorrect response. Um, I'll just say that that's wrong. And ChatGPT is regularly long, somewhere between 30 to 40% of the time. So, you know, if a kid or a teacher or anyone's really counting on it as the sole source um, or the penultimate source of information, it may not really be that. In many cases, it's not. And certainly it's interesting, the intellectual property issues, um, authors and artists are, you know, issuing class action lawsuits against these AI generative tools because it's ingested their intellectual property without representing them. And there are biases in the way that we train the data. There's biases in the data. If you read the internet, including Twitter and Reddit, there are biases implicit in all those large models of text. And it can, it can, happen in which the large language models reproduce and represent those biases. So all areas that are you know worth noting and of caution. All right, but let's talk about the kind of glass half full side of this and what it might look like. So um, a number of weeks ago, I asked uh, ChatGPT this question, what are the 10 most important skills for high school graduates in a world where artificial general intelligence exists? Now, again, we're not quite at AGI, but we're close enough that these, I think, are really quite relevant. And, you know, kind of take a second to pour over those. They probably look familiar in many cases. Um, in our world, we have a lot of schools that are working on the what they'll call the portrait of the graduate, what skills kids need. They go from, they kind of back out of high school uh, from the senior year and kind of bring it down to the middle school and elementary school and change the language and make it more accessible. Um, but, you know, these are the types of skills that we've seen for two decades now in the portrait of the graduate, critical thinking, collaboration, problem solving. Some might be a little bit, you know, different adaptability and flexibility, creativity, innovation, um, working with tech skills, you know, those might be a little bit relevant to things like uh, generative AI models that are out there, but, you know, not skills that we haven't been considering for some time. And what's interesting is that, you know, lots of kind of the sky is falling press stories, you know, the AI chat bot that's going to blow up the U.S. education system. But I'd, I'd encourage you to literally do an audit, you know, think through with your teachers or if you're in the classroom, think through yourself. Some of the assignments that teachers are providing 
and the assessments that students return back and determine whether or not those assignments, those written assignments and responses are really helping kids get to the skills on the left-hand side of that screen. This is, this is a no judgment zone, but my guess is that a higher percentage than you might imagine um, of assignments that we know the chatbot is replacing um, are things that really don't help kids get to those kind of high leverage skills that you see on the left-hand side of the screen. So that might be a useful frame and lens as you think about what these technologies can and can't do is the degree to which the types of instructional priorities and assessments really get us to the, to the types of skills that are listed there. In reality, right, a little bit more at 10,000 feet, um, the AI will disrupt every field where language, media, and cognitive work are central. So education, law, marketing, business, computer science, you know, there will be disruption, there will be replacement, there will be jobs lost. Um, in education, I think we have a unique opportunity for all sorts of reasons to really think more about the enhancement and augmentation because the replacement is less likely to happen in the same way that it might happen in other industries at least as we get started. So I think this is the moment, you know, this is probably, it's probably never been a greater opportunity to think fundamentally about what are instructional and assessment priorities? You know, how can we leverage some of these AI tools to enhance and augment instruction and assessment for the purpose, for the why of getting to those portrait of the graduate skills. So that's kind of the challenge that we might put out on the table. And now we're gonna talk about how we do that. And again, this is our lens of project-based learning. We're not you know, here to convince you to use this particular style of learning, but it's a really useful reference point for us because we we've been working with students for it for quite some time. So we're gonna look at a thing called a PIP and explore the role of generative AI and things like ChatGPT around a PIP. For us, a PIP is a personal interest project where students learn, solve, make, or do something. And in doing that very often hit those high leverage skills, communication, collaboration, problem solving, and the like. All right, if it's okay, we're gonna take just a short, short little bit here to watch a video that will give you just some background. I think sometimes it's easier to hear from students and teachers kind of what this style of learning is all about. impactful intriguing uh unique empowering exciting creativity it's interesting educational eclectic freedom independent i made a prototype of a horse board i made a password analyzer i've seen kids in my class who haven't been bringing in their snack and i thought like i need to help them out because i thought of other kids in my school too Building the thing because I like building stuff. Getting feedback from my peers in Ms. Schuhart. I feel it's going to prepare me for college, honestly. I love the curiosity. I love that they get to just whatever they want to know. You know, I think it gives them a new. I had students who said they would miss school. They came just for PIP. They come in that day, got to, yep, yeah, because they want to do it. I'm going to pause here for a brief second just to tee something up. So um, we literally in the office, I guess we need more excitement in our lives, but we kind of play this little game called chat GPT can't do this, right? And so what I'm going to show you for a second are a range of project examples. You just you know heard kids talking about it, but you'll see some project examples. And I want you to think a little bit about, you know, could a chat bot actually do that project? And I'll, I'll make an argument that it can't. Awesome. So that's just a handful, and hopefully it was helpful just to, to get a little flavor whoop, of what that looks like. And uh, the link down on the bottom, you're welcome to visit any time. That's just you know more of these style of projects. Um, we've done a, several thousand over the last few years, and um, you know I don't think there's one where I could say, oh yeah, a chatbot can solve that problem. So you could certainly make a really strong case that you know, deep, meaningful, um, student-centered project-based learning is both a great way for students to learn, practice, and master some of those high leverage skills, but also understand that it's not something that can be replaced simply by a chatbot because it's too sophisticated and too nuanced.
All right, so what we're going to do to unpack that a little bit now and talk about what ChatGPT can do that's useful in the context of a student project is to unpack this project. It's called Friendly Fertilizer. It was done by a junior in high school um, last year and look at the different aspects of the project and think about the role that a, an open AI, a tool like open AI's ChatGPT can actually augment and enhance the student's work in a positive and productive way. And I think you can probably draw some conclusions and connections to other types of teaching and learning as well. So this is Friendly Fertilizer. We're gonna take a quick look at um, Madeline's trailer. In this project, you'll be a witness to the process of creating friendly fertilizer, where I gathered used items that would be thrown away like a pellet that was donated to me. I brought these items and made something new out of them. This made it eco-friendly using old products and zero harmful materials to the earth. For example, no toxic paint and absolutely no plastic. I did lots of research about what should be in the compost and the best type of compost bins. With the research I gathered, I made sustainable compost. You can watch the rocky and sometimes challenging process just by opening today's blog page. Awesome. So this is pretty representative of, of the style of project that we'll have students working on. Um, let me walk you through the architecture of how these projects work. We're going to go relatively crisply here as we move through. My objective is, again, not to have you kind of memorize how to do a PIP. These are here and, and available to you through the slides and the recording, but rather to explore how um, ChatGPT and AI tools can be a support. So students go through three phases, a discover phase, a create phase, and a share phase. In discover, they're sort of thinking about themselves. They're doing some brainstorming. They narrow down their options, and they get to a project proposal. As they then they start working on their project, they blog about it, they do a research plan, a time management plan, and a pitch, like an elevator pitch. And then the final phase, they're kind of putting together the homepage of their project, who they are, they build a trailer, they do a final reflection and a final pitch as well. All right, so in the discover phase, um, the first thing we'll look at is learn, solve, make, do. This is a fun activity where the kids are timed and they have to brainstorm different things that they might like to learn, solve, make, do. Sometimes it's completely open-ended. Sometimes it's set in the context of a humanities project or a STEM project. And so here's a kind of a vision of what it might look like had Madeline had ChatGPD dur during her junior year. She did not. So this is a, we're recreating the scene here. And so here's a little bit of brainstorming of the different things you might like to do. Um, but this is an interesting place where you might be able to turn to the chat bot after doing a little bit of thinking and pose a question to it. This is hard to read on screen, but I'll give you a digest. She says, hi, I'm, a, I'm in high school. These are my interests. I've got different jobs. I hang out with my friends. We like to go thrifting. Do you have any suggestions for a project that I might do? I did this with a group of teachers today. They're working with a group of special ed students at middle school where they really recognized how reluctant the kids are to do something like this ideation phase. So we played with this. Projects came back a little bit complex. We said to the chat bot, can you modify these and sort of make them simplify the project ideas a little bit? And in seconds, it really provides some neat options. It's not replacing the student's work. It's just enhancing it. All right. Then we move to pick a project. Here students are doing basically a pro and con list of the different projects that Madeline wanted to work on, build a bin, grow a garden, learn to skateboard. And certainly after doing that pre-thinking, you could, I'm not suggesting every activity will work this way, but I wanna illustrate how ChatGPT can use to augment. You could turn to it and say, kind of asking for a friend project sidekick. I'm looking at these three project ideas. Do you have suggestions about pros and cons? In seconds, ChatGPT provides a response for the student. Then we move on to project proposal. This is kind of a chunky proposal where the kids talk about a range of things, the, the what of the project, the why of the project. So Madeline's got all these pieces down. She's super comfortable with it. Um, the one thing that she's not sure about, which is fair, she hasn't built one of these things before, are the materials, right? So she's able to turn to the chat bot and say, okay, I've selected to make a compost bin at my high school. I'm super excited. I'm working on my proposal. I know what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do, but I'm stuck on materials. Can you help me make a materials list? Oh, and I want everything to be sustainable. In seconds, ChatGPT provides a response. If Madeline asked her to do that in a table, that would have worked as well. All right. In the create phase, now students are actually working on their project. Interestingly, the blog is a place where the chatbot's not particularly helpful, right? They're talking specifically about their personal experience 
and the progress of their project, obstacles, challenges, and the like. And you know that's a great opportunity for the student to just independently be doing that work. One of the things that's interesting for us in the blogging area is that a lot of kids do vlogs, so they do like a video blog, and um, you know that's one of the areas I think lots of educators have recognized that uh, ChatGP quote unquote cannot do right. If the student's doing an oral presentation of their understanding and mastery, that's a really nice opportunity, and we'll have eight, nine, ten opportunities that students might do a video-based blog as they track. Uh, progress on their project. Here are some of the types of blog prompts that they will respond to, right? So this is not write a three paragraph essay about Macbeth. These are specific things about a student's experience, you know, deep, meaningful, authentic opportunities for them to write and reflect and communicate. Here's some blog examples. Um, students will often put up uh, photos that they associate with them. And then each of these attachments is actually a little video post. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of bounce over the blog update because I want to make sure there's enough time for you guys to ask some questions. But we'll look at some other pieces as well. All right, then we move on to a research plan. Again, nice opportunity for students to do some brainstorming about resources. And you could easily see, much as they do with Google, turn to the chat bot and get some idea about resources and research um, references. Again, this is one of those places, though, where if we acknowledge that 30% of the time it's hallucinating, you know, you don't want items three, four, and five to be wrong and incorrect. So we've really got to pay good attention to the degree of quality as these things emerge. Um, and it is definitely, we, you know, there's significant work happening to try to adjust and account for that. All right, now let's take a little, a little, um, kind of bird walk though. So one of the things that we're really interested in, as students do their projects, they're really building their skills incrementally as they go. So they're working on that project. It's not like you write the research plan and boom, you know everything there is to know. In reality, it's helpful to have an ongoing learning dialogue with someone, a mentor, a teacher, an outside expert about the topic. This is one of these places where chatbots can really be powerful because they're so conversational, right? So here she says, I'm doing the student interest project. I plan to build a sustainable uh, compost bin. I really don't know much about compost. Can you help me get going? Chatbot responds, great. All right, then Madeline says, this is a really helpful st starting place. The bin's gonna be near the cafeteria. Are there foods that we shouldn't put in there? In the last answer, you said something about paper. Does that mean we can put our cardboard trays in there? The chatbot holds the state from the last conversation, is able to respond to that um, question. All right, going back to the beginning, you know, she's not all that clear about like commercial fertilizer and compost and what the differences are. So the chatbot helps elevate her understanding, ongoing conversation, going back and forth, right? We you know, look, look at the title of that slide, intelligent tutor sidekick. So how is this tool really helping the student on an ongoing basis um, develop the knowledge and skills needed to be successful in the project? Great. So now um, she wants to know how long is this going to actually take? That challenged some of her assumptions and said, oh, that's not really as quick as I imagined. And so she starts doing some problem solving in conversation with the chatbot as this intelligent tutor going back and forth about how to solve that problem. They talk a little bit about community compost. She decides that there's still an opportunity to do the project at school. So she'll take kind of a two pronged approach. And then um, she remembers that the chatbot said that there may be a need for someone to maintain the compost bin. And so she asks it, can you help me write a fun, short volunteer job description for my compost champion at my school? And in seconds, the chatbot provides that. So this is all just the flow of a conversation, a back and forth conversation. We're back to Socrates, right? This is a Socratic conversation with a chatbot on a topic that the student cares about, where it's helping to build their understanding and skills. And so she says, this has been super helpful. You've answered all my questions. Are there other questions that I haven't asked that I should, right? Classic kind of opportunity. And this, you can see in the answers from ChatGPT, all sorts of additional threads that, that could be gone down. So a really fun way to think about these tools is to what degree can it really support students in a project. Teachers, you know, at some level, we have teachers who say, oh, I've got 17 projects to manage. How am I going to kind of have the expertise to manage 17 different capstone projects? And, you know, they've found ways to do it really artfully over the years, but I think tools like this will, will provide a whole new opportunity. All right, not to freak you out, but um, it is interesting to think about that intelligent tutor conversation above and beyond just a text-based chat. This is literally a really fun podcast um, called Twimmel this, this week in machine learning. And um, 
Sam Charrington did an interview with ChatGPT using another tool called Synthesia, where it basically turns the text conversation into a video-based avatar. So you can literally watch them have a conversation in real time. There are VR companies, including Engage XR, which are, you can strap on a headset and turn around and see ChatGPT and start having a conversation with ChatGPT in real time, right? So the intelligent tuner in VR, and this is sci-fi, but I don't think we're probably that far for it. You know, ChatGPT pops up on my, right next to my computer as a hologram and we can have a conversation. All right, let me come back down to earth, um, but thank you for letting me kind of get a little crazy there. Um, time management plan. This is one Liz talks about all the time. The kids really struggle with this. It's very hard for them to do. And they also reflect at the end how useful it was to do that. So here a student might do kind of a rudimentary time management plan, but then can turn to the chat bot and say, okay, great. For this project, can you help me flesh out my time management plan? And oh, by the way, put it in a table. And in moments, chat GPT responds you know, with a cohesive time management plan. Though we all those tell the kids, it's not fixed in time. I love Liz says, it's a Google doc, not a, not a sort of fixed document. It's dynamic, it's changing, but this can really help support students as they do that. All right, and then they do a pitch. This is another thing that the chat bot really can't do for them. They're having a conversation with someone, a human being and getting real feedback, not a hologram around their project and how it can be helpful. So we really like kind of highlighting the mix of places where, um, it can be a use a resource and where students can do all sorts of authentic and really wonderful work without. We'll watch just a, a second here or two. Hello, Carolyn. Why don't you tell me about your product? Okay, so for uh, this project for Skills 21, I wanted to make a compost bin to bring awareness on um, the problems of food waste and how we can fix them. That's fun. Why did you choose that? I get four demerits. I knew I was calling her Madeline and I was wrong. So it's Caroline. I, pro I apologize to you, Caroline, wherever you are. Hello, Caroline. Why don't you tell me about your All righty. So in the final phase of their project, they're doing the kind of who are you? That's personal writing. So they're just telling a, they're you know writing an overview, talking about collaboration. They upload the logo. A logo is an interesting place. We've got some schools that are starting to use some generative AI image tools to help kids design and develop a logo. Um, and then they do their last pieces, which are the, the trailer, the lights, camera, action. You know, this is another place where kids really struggle a little bit. We've had some students that will build a storyboard first and then kind of go to scripting from there. We thought we would see what this might look like. So we asked the chat bot to develop a, a draft of a video trailer and a script for students doing this sustainable compost bin. And again, in seconds, if you haven't used it in real time, I really encourage you to, it's just chat.openai.com. But you know, all these responses that you're seeing are generated in a matter of three, four, five seconds. Um, quite remarkable. All right, then the final pitch. This is a kind of final reflection and presentation, video recorded and uploaded to their project profiles, uh, often done in the context of a community celebration of learning. We'll watch Carolyn's here. I realize that in compost bins, they use a polyester or a metal lining to keep everything in the bin. That is not very sustainable. Polyester is basically just threaded plastic. So I turn to different ways to use the same netting, but with different materials. So I used um, bamboo string instead and just coiled it together. Through this process, it was a lot of hard work. <laughs> I had some successes and lots and lots of failures. I'm happy with my ending. I definitely am going to continue this project throughout the next couple months because I realized composting is good for the environment and it's like something I'm proud of that I want to continue. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to see what friendly fertilizer turns into. Did we do that? I realize that in compost bins. I always enjoy the the sort of um, pause there at the end, waiting for the applause line. <laughs> I feel for her. Yeah, so another really good example of something that Chat GPT. I think you can sort of see here that the artificial intelligence tool, you know, can't do all the various aspects of this process. It might just like Copilot, 
uh, from GitHub helps a software developer become more successful and have more productivity, it might help a student and support a student, but it certainly can't replace all the good work that they'll do that will um, help them learn, practice, and master those skills. So, you know, ChatGPT can't replace it, but it can certainly make it better, deeper, and more meaningful uh, in this scenario. All right, a few other tools that are out there, and they are growing by the moment. As you can imagine, if something becomes the most popular consumer technology or enterprise technology platform in the history of all time, that catches people's attention. So there's a lot of people releasing all sorts of AI tools, um, but a few that might be useful to think about. ChatGPT is in the middle. Again, that's just chat.openai.com. Um, Dolly is a tool by OpenAI as well. Um, as well as, and that's an image generation tool. Point E down here is text to 3D objects. So you type in a text prompt and it will create a 3D object for you. Synthesia, we saw a quick little screen of, which is the tool that turns the text into a video-based avatar. And MRF is a similar tool, although for um, just for audio. So nice ways to kind of provide text and have it communicate uh, embedded in, into a presentation or in different uh, manners. All right, so that's a lot. I mean, we ran you through a whole project, sort of proposed a concept of how these large language models can augment and enhance students in the context of a project. And so there's a lot to take in there. And I would encourage you in your own classroom, with your teachers, with your staff, with partners, to do your own version of ChatGPT can't do this. You know, what is happening in your classrooms? Um, that a chatbot's not going to simply replace. And it's quite likely that those types of instructional tasks and assessments are the things, again, that drive to those portrait of the graduate uh, skills. I mean, certainly experiment and explore. Kurt and I were having a fun conversation about all the various ways we've been using it in our own professional work. So if you're kind of agitating about what it might look like for the kids in the classroom, maybe hit the pause button on that and use it for something you're doing in your own life. It could be educational, something you're doing in your community or in church. Have it write a memo, have it write an outline, help it develop a research plan. It's, it's quite compelling just as a way to kind of learn and practice what these things can do. Certainly, we encourage you to lean into that conversation. So as many rounds of dialogue as you can with the tool to really understand what does it feel like to be in a learning conversation with a piece of AI? Because I think ultimately that will be one of the most profound and important things. You know, explore prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is just how we get sophisticated at writing the prompt for the AI. And don't be shy to load lots of content. There's a thousand character limit in Microsoft's Copilot where you write in. So at some level, there's a whole world of literacy of what needs to happen in those thousand characters for students to really leverage the very best that they can of these tools. And then um, certainly, you know, there's all sorts of sci-fi about it's going to replace everything. Again, in education, I think we probably have a really, you know, kind of safe environment to consider the us and the AI rather than us versus the AI. Uh, real quickly, Skills21 works with schools in all sorts of ways. So I just, you know, it's my job to share that. We do the PIP project that you saw today. We do a capstone project. We have an SEL project. And we're always happy to play any role. If you, you know, are interested in any of this as a thought partner, Liz and I love talking about this work. We love sharing examples. And so, you know, it doesn't have to be our stuff. We just want to help advocate for more and more of this type of learning, because I believe and we believe that in a world of AI, students are really, again, going to need these skills um, to be successful as they move into college and career. Okay, so we won't do the survey quite this second. Let me take a breath here. That was a lot of talking. You're all very patient to listen. Um, Liz, are there themes in the one word answers that we should surface and or questions that folks have raised that we want to dive into? Not seeing any questions yet, so please throw some in there. And um, a few words, amazing. Um, let's see. Uh, some haven't seen it yet, so just learning. Um, uh, some people talked about seeing how it can lighten the teacher workload. And so there's a couple of different ways that teachers are using this in other ways in the classroom. So um, I think rightfully so, the humanities teachers kind of freaked out the most first saying like, oh my gosh, I can't give all these essays that I've always given or 
you know, do I have to now, um, you know, change everything I've always done or is chat GPT going to take over the world? And uh, one of the ways that teachers have been using it, which has been really interesting to me, is that um, they are asking students to have chat GPT create the first draft of the essay and then have the students act as the teachers and go in and critique that essay. Because as Matt mentioned, it is not perfect. It is um, not always correct, not always um, really detailed. So teachers have been encouraging students to use chat as either a rough draft generator or, um, you know, allowing them to use it. And then their goal, instead of generating the content, is to critique that content. Um, so that was, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about. Teachers are using it in a lot of different ways from, uh, you can actually throw a student essay in there and ask ChatGPT to give it feedback. Um, so, you know, depending on how ethical or, um, compelled you feel to let chat GPT do that much of your work. It can um, actually critique writing, uh, but it can also do things like enhance lesson plans or um, write, uh, you know, do some of the things, you know, I think of uh, when I used to have to write lots of student reports that, um, you know, it can write a pretty, I can put in the prompt, write a report, a one paragraph report for, um, you know, somebody said for letters of recommendation. Sure, write a, write a letter of recommendation for a student who is top of her class. She plays the saxophone in the school band. She um, got an A in my class and is the student body president. They'll, it'll write a pretty decent letter um, and at least get you started. And ChatGPT, you know, for all of those things, again, is only going to be as good as the information you feed it. So um, while yes, it is a game changer, um, as some people have noted in the chat now, um, just like Google, it's not going to give you the, the only way that you're going to get what you really want is by feeding it as much information as you can. And so some people have been talking about like at which point is it more work to give chat gpt the right prompt versus writing the letter yourself right like if you're going to describe the student anyway and have chat gpt write the letter of recommendation maybe you should just write the letter of recommendation how much harder is it um chat is terrible at critical thinking as far as you know math and uh, some deep STEM stuff. So we've seen that, um, you know, pretty clearly. And that is kind of, it's kind of becoming a pretty known thing that it's not great at critical thinking. So um, I just read a blog post about a math competition where the question was to write the smallest five digit number without using the digit zero and no two numbers next to each other could be consecutive. So you couldn't have a two next to a three or a seven next to a six. Um, ChatGPT could not generate the correct answer. It was using a zero, then it was not following the directions as far as not using consecutive numbers. So when there's things like that, um, it can't critically think. Uh, so there's all kinds of different ways teachers are using it, seeing how it can be used and how it can't be used. Um, yeah, but it's a game changer. Um, I think this term, college professors were a little more nervous about it because at least last term, it dropped at the end of November, as Matt said. And by that point, most professors had seen examples of their students writing. And so if all of a sudden a student who was a, barely there semi-mediocre writer turned in this beautiful final product they might be a little suspicious um but now if you've never met this student before their writing may look beautiful all the time if they're so it's a little harder to kind of detect um just you know with the naked eye yeah 
Awesome. You know, because it's a small group too. Um, thanks, Liz. If if anybody wants to unmute, you know, unless there are other questions in the chat thread we can address, you're welcome to. Got a lot of thank yous. Okay, awesome. Um, for folks who said they hadn't seen it before, I just want to bring it up here. Um, it does not crash quite regularly, but it often will kind of be at capacity. But this is what it looks like. It's just chat.openai.com. Um, you can log in using a manual email address, or you can log in using a Google or a Microsoft account. And uh, you know, it it provides some of these examples right here. So if I were to click on that, for instance, and hit enter, um, away it goes. So if you haven't seen it, this is kind of the the speed at which it responds to things in real time, and that's not because. Um, it knew that prompt. I could have said to it, you know, to you know, write write me a a, a rap about differentiated instruction in the style of Eminem, and it would have um, created something in a equally crisp time frame. So that's what it looks like. And uh, again, it's the simplicity of that text box uh, is really interesting. Actually, here are some of the the projects that we were working on with earlier today. Kid, a student working on an ATV obstacle course. All righty. So if there aren't any other questions in chat, and it sounds, or anyone wants to chime in, we really appreciate it again. Uh, and Kurt and Sean, thank you so much for having us. We'd, we'd love being able to share the work that we're doing with personal interest projects. And you know, hopefully that was a useful frame for you to think a little bit about what this thing can do and how it might be a constructive tool so I think Liz, you've got a copy of the survey. Do you want to drop that into the? I do. Chat? Um, yeah. Can I ask a quick clarifying question? So yeah, I'm pretty sure you, you hit this. I just want to make sand. So any of those conversations on the left hand side where you were having a chat, you can go back to that, and the chat would recognize the answers they've already given you. Yep. Okay. So you could ask, "Will you further explain this point?" And they know what it's about. Yeah, and that whole Thank series you. with, uh, you know, that we kind of simulated with Carolyn in the chat bot about her compost mm -hmm. bin, where she asked a question, then a follow-up question, a follow-up question, a follow-up question, those were all real. We didn't doctor any of that. Okay, so okay. she would have just clicked on the side and it would have been that same. Okay, that's why I'm sure from the yeah, it's both clicking on the side, but also you could just type into the box and say, hey, can we go back to the conversation we were having previously okay. on X, Y, or Z? And in this very natural state, as if you're talking to a human being, um, it will be able to go back and do that. Yeah, great question, Stacey. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there was a comment um, from someone that, uh, from Jean, that a presentation she saw said to, if, to keep conversations kind of separate um, so that it doesn't, um, you get some odd results if there's too many conversation topics going on in one long thread because it does remember what you were talking about. Um, so I think um, that's a good point from Jean. Um, and also lots of, you know, this was helpful, I think, for people to see some positive ways to use it. And I mean, if you are a Twitter user and you follow, you know, you go on Edu Twitter, uh, there's, you know, following the hashtag of chat GPT or Matt, I don't know how you get all of your information, but I mean, I just, I'm on Twitter and I only follow educators on there. That's like the plat, that's what I use the platform for. Um, there are tons of conversations about different ways to use chat from middle school on up. So um, my own daughter is in eighth grade and has not yet figured out this tool. <laughs> and I was at middle school the other day and they said it's sort of coming, um, but the high schoolers, I mean, it's it's there. So, um, but there are great ways to use it productively. Um, uh, one thing to point out, please do take the survey at the links in the chat. The last five questions of the survey were actually created by chat GPT. So just as an example of how you can use it effectively uh, yourselves. Yep. And One of great. the ways I've used it often is um, I write a lot of conference proposals and or a lot of text that can only be, say, 500 words and everything I write is 700. Um, and I can throw that into chat GPT and say, can you take this text and cut it down to 500 words? 
and it'll do it for me or 500 characters, whatever the, you know, the parameter you give it, because that's the worst part of writing conference proposals is getting it all in, in those short, you know, chunks. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks everybody. We really appreciate the opportunity to, to chat, no pun intended. And um, yep. please, if we can be helpful in any way, please follow up. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Liz. No problem. Awesome. Love this. Take care, everybody. Bye.